welcome back for another lesson for English 9 for the week of May 11th. This is lesson two and supports both the print pathway as well as the digital pathway. We'll be discussing oral interpretation and Romeo and Juliet. I'm Carrie Lockery, a resource teacher with the Office of Secondary English Language Arts. Be sure to gather all the resources for this lesson before we begin. Oral interpretation pulls words from the page of literature and gives dimension to the reader's voice and body. Oral interpretation brings a story and a book to life and makes the message clear to the audience. We have two goals for today's lesson. First, we will look at the characteristics of an oral interpretation. Then we will look at preparing a performance script. Have you ever heard of an oral interpretation before? Maybe this term is new to you, but I bet if you think about it, you'll notice it's in our everyday lives. What about when lawyers read evidence to juries? What about musicians performing poetry to audiences? We just call them songs. What about when parents read to their children? One of the most important steps in oral interpretation is selecting meaningful passages of literature. If you could choose any children's book or story to read with different voices, which would you choose? Why? I'll give you a moment to think about it. This week I wanted to share with you my answer to think about it. When I think of oral interpretation and stories, that are very powerful, especially stories from my childhood. I think of this book, Frog and Toad Are Friends. One certain chapter especially sticks out in my mind of a great one to use for oral interpretation. Here, let me read just a little passage for you. Frog ran up the path to Toad's house. He knocked on the front door. There was no answer. Toad, Toad, shouted Frog, wake up, it's spring. Blah said a voice from inside the house. Frog and Toad continue to argue about what month it is. Finally, Frog grabs Toad's calendar. Here's how this chapter ends. Then Frog ran back to Toad's bed. Toad, Toad, wake up! It is May now. What? said Toad. Can it be May so soon? Yes, said Frog. Look at your calendar! Toad looked at the calendar. The May page was on top. Why, it is May, said Toad as he climbed out of bed. Then he and Frog ran outside to see how the world was looking in the spring. I chose this book because of the message. The message about friendship and encouraging one another is so powerful. So let's learn about it. Here are some characteristics of oral interpretation. First of all, oral interpretation usually consists of several participants engaging in a dramatic reading of a text. Usually there's no memorization, no movement, and a minimum number of props, or no props at all. Participants read the text using various voices that speak alone, in unison, and sometimes with overlapping voices. The voices vary in volume and inflection. This is the most important characteristic. All vocal choices are made in order to enhance the audience's understanding of the story and to emphasize the message or the theme of the story. There really are only two steps in preparing a performance script. The first step is choosing the portion of the text you will have a group perform. You really need to think about which portion of the text best communicates the message and theme. Then you have to decide how much of the text you will need. Do you only need a little bit from the beginning? Or maybe just some from the end? Or maybe you'll combine a little bit from the beginning, a little from the middle, and a little from the end. The second step is to mark the text to reflect your thinking on how you would perform them. And so you wanna make sure your markings are very understandable for your performers. You also 
want to make sure your performers understand the types of markings that you will use. I've included the sample markings from the lesson, but you don't have to use these. You could always come up with your own and include that key in your script. So let's try it. We're going to practice marking three examples from Romeo and Juliet. All three examples come from Act 1, and all three examples have a message about love. So the first example is spoken by Lady Capulet to Juliet. What say you? Can you love the gentleman? This night you shall behold him at our feast. I read that line with not much emphasis. Now listen as I read my oral interpretation of the same line. What say you? Can you love the gentleman? Notice that I added emphasis to the first you, and I showed that by marking it with an underline. I then added a slash between the first question and the second question. That's a symbol for a pause in my markings. And while an oral interpretation does not need any hand gestures at all, I added a pointing finger to reinforce that it's Juliet's decision to make. This is a reminder to choose meaningful text. Lady Capulet asks Juliet to consider Paris. The message is that asking is better received than telling. Finally, notice that I did not mark every word. I only made three markings in this line, and all three markings reinforce Juliet's decision to make. Now I'm going to give you a moment to try the next line. This night you shall behold him at our feast. So let's try example two. It comes from Act One, Scene Four. Mercutio is talking to Romeo about his personal views about love. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes. When I read it this way, it's easy to miss the meaning. Now listen. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. Reading it this way emphasizes Queen Mab, a fictional, mythical creature of love. The voice inflection shows that Mercutio thinks love is just like a fictional, mythical story, a fairy tale. Now see if your markings can support that. Our final example comes from Act 1, Scene 5. Romeo has just asked a serving man, What lady is that which doth enrich the hand of yonder knight? The serving man says he doesn't know. And so then Romeo begins speaking, maybe to the servant man or to himself. Romeo says, Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night. Now listen to my oral interpretation. Oh, she to teach the torches to burn bright. Notice the pause right before she. That helps the reader or audience to focus on the female Romeo is talking about. I also wanted to add emphasis or just a special emphasis to only the beginnings of burn and bright since Romeo uses that alliteration. Romeo sees a beautiful woman at the feast. Earlier in the evening, he told his friends he could never love anyone as much as he loved Rosaline. But this isn't Rosaline. This is Juliet. And so there could be many interpretations for what Romeo means by quickly shifting his love and affection from Rosaline to now Juliet. I'll give you a moment to try the next line. For this show what you know, you are asked to create a script for an oral interpretation using the markings from the learn about it or creating your own markings and including a key. Here are some passages from lesson one that are options for choosing a meaningful passage. 
If you are completing the print pathway, the passage has been chosen for you and the text is included in your resources. If you are completing the digital pathway, you will want to choose from one of these, or you may choose a different passage with your teacher's permission. You will also want to make sure to read your teacher's special directions about how many lines you need to complete. Your teacher may also share with you several different formats or options for submitting your work. For today's Show What You Know, we have a sample for you. It's the same text we used in Lesson 1. It's from Act 1, Scene 5. You'll notice the original text on this screen, and then we will show you our script. I have a special guest with me today, Sean Lockery, who will be reading the parts of Romeo. Taking Juliet's hand. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? I, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Oh then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray. Grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Now we will read from the oral interpretation script we created. You'll notice the script on the left-hand side and some notes on the right-hand side. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. So you probably noticed that Romeo emphasized the words related to the religious conceit. His gestures and movements emphasized the comparison is to his hand and lips. And so you may notice all the words highlighted in lesson one have now been underlined to emphasize them even more. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrim's hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Did you notice that Juliet's words were spoken both as a reply, but also as a flirtatious counter explanation? Have not saints lips and holy palmers too? I pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. So hopefully you notice Juliet's pacing with the words that they being two beats, followed by a slight pause before saying must use also as two beats. And finally, adding another short pause before saying in prayer as two beats, emphasizing that word prayer. Your final task is to write a brief paragraph explaining your choices you made as you created your oral interpretation. Here is my sample paragraph. This section of the play advances the theme that love can be like a spiritual journey that requires dedication and patience. Using the conceit filled with religious words and symbols, Romeo explains that Juliet is something holy and chosen by God for him. Juliet responds that Romeo is like one on a spiritual journey and that she is more similar to him than different. Romeo hopes to kiss Juliet as a sign that his spiritual journey was successful. Juliet explains that Romeo needs to continue on his journey to gain God's favor, to be kissed by her. We hope this sample and paragraph will help you with your oral interpretation. Thanks for joining me today. We're here to talk about archetypes and according to the title, why are archetypes everywhere? This video supports GT9 English for the week of May 11th, Lesson 2. 
I'm Jennifer Mead, a resource teacher with Advanced Academics, and the title actually comes from one of my former students who, after we had studied archetypes for a while, said, hey, archetypes are everywhere. And my answer was, that's the point. And so I hope by the end of this video, you'll start to understand that indeed archetypes are everywhere, and that's the point. So where do archetypes come from? They're generally credited to the work of a Swiss psychiatrist named Carl Jung. You can see from the dates here that he lived the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th. And he was contemporaries with Sigmund Freud and Friedrich Nietzsche, who you may have studied if you've done any psychological criticism. Now, what he said, he, Jung, is that all people share a collective unconscious. And this is a set of information that we don't know that we know, but indeed we all possess it. And because all of us, regardless of all time and all culture, because we have this shared understanding of these universal patterns and images, that there's a kind of shorthand that we can use to talk about ideas or when we start to see these symbols or plots or people or characters come up that we're going to understand that they're a part of a pattern that we know innately even if we don't know we know think about this have you ever watched a movie and you say oh my gosh i know what's going to happen and it turns out that you're exactly right that i know what happens feeling might be about archetypes is the filmmaker using a pattern that we recognize, that we have become so accustomed to, that we know it is a part of our being, and that we can just expect that we can participate because of this shared understanding? As people have studied more and learned more in psychiatry, the ideas of Carl Jung have been largely dismissed in that field but they do remain a very important part of literary criticism. Archetypes are really important as we study symbols, settings, characters, and plot structures, because all of those use archetypes to add a depth and a richness. And the same way illusions do, they work as a kind of shorthand to help bring an enormous amount of information and richness to a character or to an event or to the arc of a plot that people will understand. And remember that understanding is innate to them. It's not anything we necessarily have to be taught, although being taught about archetypes as we're doing today does really help you to become aware of them. You already know them because they're a part of, remember that term again, that collective unconscious that Carl Jung believes we all share. Starting to look at situation archetypes, these are plot arcs or plot events that I think you're really going to recognize. Let's start at the top with the battle of good and evil. That seems to me like every superhero movie ever made. We want Superman to win. We want Captain America to win. And more importantly than wanting them to win, we know they will win because that's what this archetype shows us, that in the battle of good and evil, good prevails. We want that. And more importantly, we're glad when it happens because that's what we know should happen. That in our collective unconscious is what we're taught to believe, that ultimately good will triumph over evil. Death and rebirth, that makes me think about the Lion King. It's showing that circle of life, the circle of life that's so important, they wrote a song about it. Are you humming it right now? I know I am. So think about how we lose people in our lives, particularly those who are older, who have been the teachers, and how the young now carry on and learn their own lessons and then perpetuate that cycle, having their own children and teaching their lessons and moving on. If we look at a couple of these together, the initiation, the journey, the quest, the task, these all start to become part of the hero's journey. Now, this is in itself a really important archetype that has a very particular arc. You have the call, you have crossing of the threshold, you have 
different adversities. There's a trip to the underworld. And if you think about what you read in the Odyssey, that really is a perfect example of this archetype. But we can also think about it with other stories that might be more modern. Star Wars is an equally adept look at a hero's journey. Luke Skywalker loses his family. He gets the call when R2-D2 shows him the video of Princess Leia, and off he goes to learn about the Force and ultimately fight Darth Vader, which gets us back then to the triumph of good over evil. Also, this is Harry Potter. This is Percy Jackson. If you follow kind of the details in the books, you'll see that it follows the pattern of the hero's journey very, very closely. And I will argue that that's partly why we enjoy those stories so much, because it fits in with these archetypes. It taps into what we know about what we want to have happen, because we know in that innate part of ourselves that that's how this should work out. So let's think about magic weapons. I'm thinking magic wands. I'm thinking lightsabers. I'm thinking about Spider-Man spider webs. I'm thinking about Batman's utility belt. I'm thinking about Wonder Woman's magic cuffs. There are so many of these in movies that though it might seem like a gimmick, if we think about it in an archetypal sense, it takes on a much, much bigger meaning. Okay, let's take a look at setting archetypes. The first one is the garden, and it says here in the note that it symbolizes love and fertility. I also want you to think think about the idea of paradise very closely associated with the garden. The archetypal garden is the Garden of Eden from the Bible. Remember, Adam and Eve were tempted, ate the apple, were cast out of paradise. And they were tempted by a snake who represented the devil. That's an important idea we're going to pick up later. Hang on to that. Let's think about the forest. It seems like a garden, but often very different. It's wild. It's dangerous. If we spend a little time in the forest behind Hagrid's hut, there's all those scary spiders. It was the place that they were forbidden to go. And it's a place where they only went when they knew they had to face really dangerous enemies. You'll notice too, when they went in the forest, it was almost never alone. Water is always important because it's a cleansing and it's rebirth. And think about how a river can be a metaphor for a journey. When you have the chance and you read Huckleberry Finn, that really is a perfect example of using a river as an archetype. If you've read The Old Man in the Sea, you might remember that Santiago really looks at the sea both as an enemy, but also as a place of great, great bounty and where he learns really important lessons about life and acceptance. The island, for those of you who've read Lord of the Flies, know how important the setting of the island is in that book. When we see an island, we know that it's isolated. We know that those people are only going to be able to interact with themselves. So what is it about this story that makes it so perfectly set in this closed environment, in this small space? And why is it that we want to explore that? Stay with Lord of the Flies. Simon climbs to the top of the mountain, and it's there that he gets perhaps the most important lesson that any of the boys learned in the book. And think about then how, when he comes back down from the mountain and he tries to convey that message to others, what happens. And so it really is that kind of spiritual journey to go up high where others aren't, where it's a struggle to get there, and then what kind of enlightenment that you get. When I think about the wasteland, my mind immediately jumps to the Hunger Games. And let's think about all of the people from all the different districts and what makes each of those, dis those districts a wasteland of itself. And what is it that they learn there? What strengths do they develop? What kind of adversity can they face because of where their origins are in these wastelands? How about the small town? I'm thinking about the lottery, which we read a few lessons back. Immediately when we think about small towns, it's 
in a way like an island, it's this really closed off environment. Everybody knows each other, but there's also probably an element of a long history. Think about how in this society for the lottery, they had these traditions that even though they all probably thought that it should end and it wasn't the right thing to do, they continue to do it year after year after year because it's so much a part of the fabric of that small town. Can you imagine if Shirley Jackson had set the lottery in New York City? No, I can't either. So think about all those films you've seen that take place in a small town and think about how it instills a particular set of values, how we have an expectation about the interactions of the people. And again, how that all taps in to that idea of archetypes. Character archetypes are what so often allows you to say, oh, I know this guy. That's right, you've met him before. How about the bully? Isn't there a bully in every young adult book you've ever read? I think about Biff and how he bullies Marty McFly in Back to the Future. I think about Draco Malfoy and how he bullies Harry and poor Neville in Harry Potter. The bully, that's the guy we know. The Creature of Nightmare. Think about all of the different monsters in Harry Potter that the kids had to face. I particularly think about the Death Eaters and how they fly in and can terrify an entire community just by their appearance. Now, remember when I asked you to remember the Garden of Eden and how Eve was tempted by the snake? Well, the snake has come to represent the devil. So let's think about Voldemort. I know I shouldn't be writing his name down. He should not be named. But Voldemort, not by accident, when we finally see him, looks like a snake. And that association of him and his evil and connection that way back to that idea of being a devil figure is really important. The evil genius, well, this is so many of the kind of nemesis characters in superhero films. It's also, I think, to some degree, Snape, although for those of you who finished the series, we learn some other things about him later. I'm a big fan of the Friendly Beast. The Friendly Beast is often a sidekick, and the sidekick is another archetype as well. It's the character like Ron, who is essential to the hero, but will never be the hero for any number of reasons. I think about the Friendly Beast, my favorite is Chewbacca, who is forever walking by Han Solo's side and is always there and will save the day in a pinch. I also think in some ways you could make an argument for Hagrid as a friendly beast as well. Notice how huge and imposing and scary he is when the kids first meet him. Our hero, we've talked about the hero's journey. They're essential, Harry, Percy, Luke, all the gang. And it often at the beginning of their stories, they are initiates, they're young, they need people to help them to grow into their heroic qualities. And that's where mentors are so important. That's Yoda. That's Dumbledore. It's also Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was the first to teach Luke Skywalker about the Force. But if you remember, he allows himself to be killed by Darth Vader so that Luke can carry on with what he's doing and escape. So it, he does become a martyr because he dies for the cause of the rebels because he wants Luke to be successful. I think if you ask anyone about star-crossed lovers, they're gonna to talk to you about Romeo and Juliet. These characters are so ingrained and this idea of these young lovers who meet their death for the sake of love, it's just become a part of the fabric of what we all understand. The wizard, well, we've talked about wizards a lot those special powers that allow them to succeed, that allow them to develop and grow. And that gets us way back to our situational, situational archetype of good defeating evil. I hope that through this very quick look at different kinds of our archetypes, you start to realize how very important they are to our understanding and enjoyment. And I hope that you go off from here and start to see archetypes everywhere. Thanks. I'll see you next week.